Earlier this week, a federal jury found that the 2013 Katy Perry hit Dark Horse infringed on the copyright of Christian rapper Flame's 2008 song, Joyful Noise. Now, the two songs don't share the same melody, nor the same chord progression, or bass line, or drum groove, but they do share a similar synth ostinato, or a repeated melodic fragment that helps support the main melody. We only hear this ostinato in the verses for Dark Horse, but we hear it throughout A Joyful Noise. It's a descending phrase in staccato quarter notes that starts on the mediant in the key of A minor, the third degree of the scale, and descends down to the tonic. It sounds like this. Dark Horse's ostinato sounds suspiciously similar. It's in the key of B flat minor, but it's been transposed here to the key of A minor. Wait, 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 I'm sorry about that. That's actually not the Katy Perry. That's the Adagio from Bach's Violin Sonata in F minor. This is Katy Perry's Dark Horse. Wait, sorry, got confused again. That's the traditional Christmas carol, Jolly Old St. Nicholas. This is the Katy Perry. Actually, I'm sorry, I keep getting confused. That's the spiritual Go Down Moses. This is the Katy Perry. Wait a second, I'm so sorry. That's actually Akira Ikafube's theme to 1954's Godzilla. This is actually Katy Perry's Dark Horse. So the question is, is this similar enough to Joyful Noise to legally be the same piece of music? The jury seems to have ruled that that is the case. Now, if we look at the text from the original lawsuit, we don't find any mention of any specific musical elements that Dark Horse allegedly illicitly took from Joyful Noise. Instead, we get several pages of alleged damages, and also, weirdly, several separate complaints about witchcraft and pagan imagery, which have nothing to do with the song, its lyrics, or its composition. All of the analysis and music theory that the plaintiff brought to the table came from one source, their expert witness, musicologist Todd Decker, who is the the chair of the music department at Washington University in St. Louis. According to Decker, Dark Horse is at its essence the same composition as Joyful Noise because of a similar synth riff that shares, quote, five or six points of similarity, including pitch, rhythm, texture, pattern of repetition, melodic shape, and timbre. Decker took care to emphasize the similarity of timbre and tone color, noting the synthesized sounds create a pingy, artificial sound in the beat. Decker is not a sound engineer. He is a musicologist who is trained in 20th century pop, film music, and 18th century European art music. But even he should be able to tell the differences in timbre between the two ostinatos because they're in fact quite distinct. Joyful Noise's ostinato is articulated with a sawtooth waveform, with a very distinct portamento, or glide between pitches, that distorts the pitch transients every time the melody switches between different scale degrees. The sound of Dark Horse's riff is airier and breathier, almost like it's imitating a vocal sample. But that doesn't matter, though, because you can't copyright tone color. Otherwise, somebody could just own the sound of piano. Wait, wait, wait a second. Hold up, hold up. You can't do that. You can't do that. Uh, that's copyrighted. Wait, no, I wasn't playing any copyrighted song. Oh, not the song, it was the timbre that you're using. The sound of piano has been copyrighted, so if you want to play that song, you have to use a different sound. All right. Thanks, Todd Decker. Which is unfortunately the implication of this case. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. What are the pitch similarities between the riffs? Well, they share a similar descending melodic arc, starting on the third degree of the minor scale and descending down diatonically by step. Dark Horse ends on the fifth scale degree, the dominant, and Joyful Noise ends on the tonic on its first repetition, although on its second repetition it descends down to what sounds like the sixth degree of the minor scale. However, because of the extreme portamento, the pitch identity is somewhat masked on that final note. Charlie Harding of Vox has transcribed it as scale degree five, potato, potato. Both riffs use staccato quarter notes and descend stepwise in a minor key in a similar way. But the same thing could be said about those examples that I played at the beginning, like the Bach and Go Down Moses. Despite this, Todd Decker asserted that the descending melodies of both ostinatos are unique. I have not seen another piece that descends in the way that these two do. Interesting. Check this out. This was a short melodic phrase taken from the 1927 tune Old Man River from Showboat, written by Oscar Hammerstein and Jerome Kern. The lyric that's paired with this phrase is, is soon forgotten, 
which seems appropriate because Todd Decker seems to have forgotten this phrase, despite the fact that he wrote a book on the song Old Man River and mentioned this phrase nine times in the book. Granted, this lyric is not a repeating ostinato, and the context is wildly different, but the melody descends in the exact same manner as the riff from Joyful Noise. Probably the most closely related ostinato to Joyful Noise comes from 1984's Moments in Love from the English synth-pop band Art of Noise. <laughs> The synth that I've been using throughout this video was actually sampled directly from that song. There's actually an entire body of work that's been built around sampling this quarter note ostinato originally found in Moments of Love. It's been sampled 120 times by various hip hop artists. And you can hear a similar idea in 2007's This Is Why I'm Hot, which is most likely where Flame's producer got the idea for Joyful Noise. <laughs> We're getting really hung up on this one synth riff, because in Dark Horse it's just the background texture for one of the verses. It has the same musical function as a chord progression or a drum groove. It serves to highlight the melody, but it's not the song itself. Up until this point, it seemed like only melodies could be copyrighted in the composition of song. However, the recent court decision surrounding Robin Thicke's Blurred Lines and Marvin Gaye's Got To Give You Up has thrown all of this into question. Musician and copyright lawyer Charles Cronin recently wrote that, until judges recognize and curb this perfidious, or perhaps merely witless, conflating of sound and music by expert musicologists playing to the sympathies of bewildered jurors, we can expect a continuing blitz of meritous claims like this one, and the deleterious constraints and ambiguities they impose on popular musicians in the American music industry. This is why the lawsuit demanded a trial by jury, because they wanted to confuse non-musician, non-expert jurors with fancy music theory jargon, jargon that was provided by their expert witness, Mr. Todd Decker. Todd, let's take a walk. Listen, man, I know you're just trying to get paid, and I totally respect that we all are, and I hate the fact that I have to defend Katy Perry in all of this. <laughs> you can be a bit of a culture vulture, but man, think about what you did here. You convinced a jury that the idea of quarter notes descending in a minor scale from the third degree originated in 2008 with Christian rapper Flame. Like, you testified under oath that this idea was original to him. Like, there's only a certain number of notes that can be recombined in musical compositions. And I think it sets a dangerous precedent to say that somebody can own such a specific piece of our shared musical language. Imagine if somebody or some corporate entity could own a word or a phrase. What kind of corporate capitalist hellscape would that usher in? Fortunately, that dystopia is not quite here yet. But listen, Todd, man, you're helping bring about the musical equivalent of that dystopia with this court case, and you're doing it in a fairly intellectually dishonest manner, because I sincerely doubt you would make the arguments that you made in court at a like academic conference, for example, or you wouldn't write them down in a scholarly article because your academic peers would absolutely eviscerate you for saying some of those things. And yet in front of a jury of your peers, you said them. These are non-experts, these aren't musicians, and they were confused by your jargon. And the precedent that's set by it is kind of dangerous. Man, I hope that you are paid well, because you kind of sold us all out on this. 